is beautifully supposed by some that Israel's feast represents the course of time. This earth's days from creation down to the final end, the lamb slain at Passover commences it. And the eighth day of the happy feast of tabernacles is its close. While the Sabbath, the rest, God's rest in himself, and his creatures rest around him, both precedes and follows this course of time. I'm Rob Congdon, Director of Congdon Ministries International and CMI-TV. I'm so glad you've joined me today for our second session as we study the Feast of the Lord, overviewed in Leviticus chapter 23. In our last study, we did an introduction, if you will, to the feasts, and we saw how important it is to understand the three purposes of these seven Feasts of the Lord. The first is that God uses these as seven appointments with Israel that will represent the mountaintop events for that nation in its history, from its beginning to the new heavens and new earth. We then saw that there also in the feasts are seven pictures that God has given to us to help us to understand seven steps in our personal spiritual life as we grow in the Lord, from salvation until our complete sanctification and glorification with Him. In this session, we're going to begin studying those seven feasts. We're going to be looking at those feasts from those three viewpoints, and we're going to see how not only do those teach that it is a mountaintop event of Israel, not only is it seven spiritual steps in our lives if you know the Lord as your Savior, but it also serves as signposts along the roads of history, telling us where we are in God's plan for history. As we begin today, we're at the very beginning of that journey, and we're going to be looking at that first feast of the Lord, Passover. Now, looking at Passover the first feast of the Lord. Victor Buxbazen, founder of the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry, commented as follows, The deliverance of Israel from Egypt is the central point in Jewish history and worship, even as Calvary is the central point in the Christian faith. The events depicted in the feast clearly reveal why deliverance was so significant for the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. We of the church age can learn much as well. Please turn to Leviticus 23 and verse 4. And there we read, These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. Or as we learned in our first session, you shall proclaim in their appointed times. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Although only the Lord's brief instruction as to when Passover is to be observed is related in this single verse of Leviticus, the book of Exodus is our key reference for this feast, as well as Israel's mountaintop historical event associated with it. I'm sure that most of you know the story of Israel's sojourn in Egypt and the ten plagues that led to the night when the Lord slew the firstborn sons of every Egyptian household. He spared Israel's firstborn sons because the blood of the lambs had been sprinkled on the doorposts and the lintels of every Jewish home so that the Lord could pass over their home and spare the firstborn. 
For time's sake, we will briefly look at this feast to learn the primary lesson God demonstrates through it. Israel's sojourn in Egypt fulfilled a prophecy that God had given to Abraham long before. There he indicated that someday Abraham's seed, or his offspring, would be strangers in a foreign land and would serve there as slaves for 400 years. He relates this in Genesis 15, verse 13, where we read, God said, And God said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. And they, that's the Egyptians, shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards they shall come out, that's Israel, with great substance or wealth. Notice God indicated three important points in this passage and prophecy. The first point is that God would allow their slavery, but for a limited time of 400 years. Second, God would judge the nation that did this to Israel. And third, God would see that they gained the wealth from their captors. In fulfilling this prophecy, some two to three million descendants of Abraham found themselves enslaved to the Egyptians. God would use these 400 years of enslavement and immersion in the Egyptian culture, first of all, to teach his people to be separate from the pagan world and live as God desired them to live instead. Secondly, to teach them to be shepherds, a profession that was abhorrent to the Egyptians. Now, this occupation would prevent their assimilation with the Egyptian culture and would discourage intermarriage between the Egyptians and the Hebrews. While Joseph ruled as Pharaoh's representative, Egypt prospered. The Hebrews lived in nearby Goshen. They prospered as well. But following Joseph's death, the scriptures say a new king came into Egypt, a new army that conquered and ruled Egypt. The Hebrews were then enslaved by these leaders of Egypt who did not know or remember Joseph. Because many of the Hebrews' experiences parallel man's spiritual journey through life, God chose to use this first feast, Passover, to picture and teach about the first step in an individual's spiritual life journey. God would use physical slavery to portray man's spiritual slavery to sin and his need for deliverance. Now, until one feels the full weight of the bondage of sin, one cannot really appreciate their need for salvation. The Feast of Passover memorializes God's deliverance of Israel from slavery. In addition to the obvious physical significance, Passover also teaches us about the workings involved in spiritual deliverance. As God kept this first appointment with his people, he brought about the birth of a nation, the nation of Israel. God used Pharaoh and Moses to achieve this birth. Now God prefigured Israel's national deliverance when he providentially delivered the infant Moses from death. The martyr Stephen in Acts chapter 7 verse 35 called Moses a deliverer. He said, this Moses whom they refused saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. Further, we're told in Hebrews 11 verse 23 that by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child 
and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. It was God who initiated the events that led to this appointment when he met with Moses in the wilderness at the burning bush. That was recorded in Exodus chapter 3. There we read in verse 7 that God began to link physical deliverance with spiritual deliverance. For God wrote, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land. We know that this is a divine appointment, for the words of verse 16 point this out. God says, I have surely visited you. Whenever we see that God visits his people Israel, that is that exceptional, special moment that he is working with them and in their history. Now, God intended for his people, the children of Israel, verse 10, to come out to the wilderness for the express purpose noted in verse 18, which was to sacrifice to the Lord. Remember the meaning of the word feast? included the idea of honoring a person. They were to go and sacrifice to their Lord, to honor their Lord. Sacrifice begins the picture of spiritual deliverance for sin. Now, turn over to Exodus 7. In this chapter, God calls the children of Israel, my people. It's here that Israel's unity as a nation set apart by God, is introduced. This would be the outcome, if you will, of the ten plagues or great judgments upon Egypt. Look at verse 4. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt, and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. Following Israel's deliverance from Egypt, God brought Moses back to the very same mountain, that's Mount Horeb, also called Mount Sinai, where Moses first met God at the burning bush. God did this to assure both Moses and the people that the God of Israel was the one who delivered them. This mountain is also where God not only established the first appointment of Passover for his people to gather to honor him through a sacrifice at the appointed time, but also this is where, through the law, he instituted the six remaining feasts. Two noteworthy observations arise concerning the Passover. First, the Hebrew people themselves did not seek to escape from Egypt. They merely wanted release from the slavery of their taskmasters. Second, they didn't flee from Egypt as refugees, taking nothing with them. God's action through the Passover demonstrates the fact that the deliverance from slavery requires, first of all, complete separation from the old life and is possible only by the provision of God and his grace. When we relate this truth to the spiritual deliverance from sin, we recognize that many people only want release from slavery to sinful habits, but are unwilling to separate themselves from the world. Remember, we are to be in the world, but not of it. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 1, God says, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand, literally under compulsion, shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. God had to use Pharaoh to drive them or push them out because the Hebrews were reluctant to leave. Always remember, as God liberated the Hebrews, he simultaneously judged the enemies of the young nation. The purpose of the Exodus, both positive and negative, 
demonstrates God's love for his people and his just actions regarding sin. This first feast, the Feast of Passover, memorializes that great event. Over the next 40 years, the Hebrews repeatedly tried to return to Egypt with its pagan culture and religion. The reluctance of the Hebrews to leave the world they had known demonstrates the difficulty of separating oneself from the world spiritually. This should serve as a reminder to us that if we are lax or apathetic in our spiritual lives, if we take God for granted, we too can relapse back to our old nature and life. From the standpoint of world history, this event stands out as unique. After all, what nation would willingly drive its slaves out of the country? Thus, Passover became the focal point of Jewish history because it crystallized Israel's national identity and it marked the birth of the Jews as a free people. The lessons learned through the experiences of the Egyptian slavery and redemption provide a powerful basis for the development of many important concepts of the Jewish faith. Passover began the progressive fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and, by so doing, started a great prophetic clock of Israel. Just as an infant experiences a new freedom from confinement at birth, the former slaves experienced a new freedom at that first Passover. Since Passover was the first appointment between God and Israel, God chose an appropriate symbol worthy of representing that event. The Passover month would mark the first month of the calendar year as recorded in chapter 12 and verse 2 of Exodus, where God says, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It shall be the first month of the year to you. With the Passover, God instituted a yearly remembrance of that day, that he fulfilled prophecy by Israel's exodus from Egypt and the Egyptians. This was the nation and its people's deliverance from slavery and began a new life of freedom as God's people. With the Passover, God completed his first appointment with Israel. With the Passover, God pictured the first doctrinal or spiritual truth of the seven feasts. The spiritual deliverance from the slavery of sin needed by every human being since Adam. With spiritual deliverance also comes a new godly nature. God's second appointment with Israel serves to teach the next step in the nation of Israel's spiritual journey and in one's Christian life. God's second historic appointment with the nation of Israel, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, immediately followed the Passover. Remember that the Feasts of the Lord are divided into three groupings. As can be seen from the early calendar, unleavened bread follows hard upon the heels of the Passover. This close proximity is not accidental. God associated the two events with specific intent. Again, Andrew Bonar has said that the Passover was the cause, the feast of unleavened bread, the effects. What effects? The effects of their deliverance from the grasp of Egypt. God used the historic event symbolized by the Feast of Unleavened Bread to form the Hebrews into an actual nation. Like a new baby, this newly created nation needed care and instruction. Thus we read in Leviticus 23, beginning at verse 6, 
and on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Now look at the calendar. Notice what stands out in comparison to Passover on the 14th day of the first month. Do you see it? The feast begins on the very day after the Passover. But this feast is seven days in length versus one day for the Passover. It has two Sabbaths, one at the start and one at the end. When we consider these key distinctions, it presents several questions to us. For example, why seven days? Why two Sabbaths? Why right immediately after the Passover? By answering these questions, we'll learn more about our spiritual events in our life. To find these answers, we must turn back to the history of the events in Israel, which immediately followed their Passover deliverance. Let's consider the situation on the day after Passover. Immediately following Passover, God's people faced a crucial situation in Egypt. Just the night before, God had redeemed Israel from the bondage of the Egyptian slavery through the shed blood of the Passover lambs. For all practical purposes, the lamb served as substitutes, purchasing the life of each individual Israelite firstborn when the Lord passed through Egypt, there slaying the firstborn sons of the Egyptians, but he passed over the Hebrew homes that had the blood on the doors. Since God actually passed through Egypt on the night of the Passover and honored the sign of the blood over the doors, the firstborns, those who owed their lives and service to God when he passed over them. Before God could use them as a true nation, however, they needed to be separated from Egypt's influence and the land. The events of the preceding night largely accomplished this purpose. It changed the balance of fear. Prior to Passover, the Hebrews lived in fear of their Egyptian taskmasters. After Passover, the Egyptians feared the Hebrews and the power of their God. We see in Psalm 105, verse 38, it says, Egypt was glad when they, the Hebrews, departed for the fear of them fell upon them. The fear of the Hebrews fell upon the Egyptians. Fear is the key to this second appointment. The Egyptians feared that further destruction would befall them if they retained their Hebrew slaves any longer. After the tenth plague now, the Egyptians feared not only the events unfolding before their very eyes, but also their Hebrew slaves. When the time came, they were more than willing to accept the consequence of losing their labor force. For the Hebrews, they had lived with great fear since they had been heavily persecuted and oppressed. Recall that as a result of the preceding nine judgments, Pharaoh had increased their workload and the strictness of their taskmasters. After the events of Passover, the Hebrews probably feared Egyptian reprisals for the deaths that had occurred. When they were told to leave, or literally pushed out, they needed no further urging. The day after Passover was the very day they left Egypt. It was the first day they were no longer slaves. No longer were they forced to work. 
Thus, the Feast of Unleavened Bread remembers this first day of freedom from work as slaves. How does it remember it? By declaring that first day of the feast to be a Sabbath, a day of no servile, in other words, no necessary work at all. This feast Sabbath is observed the very day after Passover to show that God's deliverance brought immediate release from slavery. This is the history of the feast, but it still doesn't answer why the feast is seven days long and why it has two Sabbaths instead of just one. The next key to answering this puzzle is the meaning of leaven. The Hebrews were now wealthy. Remember, the Egyptians had given them gold and silver and told them, get out! The Hebrews thus departed in such haste that they did not have time for leaven to rise for the bread for the needed journey that they were about to take. Therefore, we are told in Exodus 12, verse 34, that they baked unleavened bread. Now, that's bread that doesn't need to rise before baking. It's a bread that can be prepared in haste. You merely mix the ingredients, you bake it. We read in Exodus 12, verse 34, And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. You see, leaven, of course, is yeast. This didn't need yeast. In the ancient world, the leaven for the next batch of bread always came from a small amount of dough put aside from the previous batch. Thus, leaven's effect propagated from loaf to loaf to loaf to loaf. But in their haste to leave Egypt, the Hebrews didn't have time to leaven their bread. They couldn't t wait for that leaven or yeast to have an effect. Instead, they were forced to leave the leavened sample or part that they were going to use for the next batch. They had to leave it behind in Egypt. So what? Well, God used this as a symbol of remembrance of the occasion, hence the name Feast of Unleavened Bread. This symbol pictures the action of the leaven or yeast rather than the yeast itself. The key point to note is that given an adequate time, yeast permeates an entire batch of dough. Now notice, leaven in and of itself is not sin. Rather, the scripture uses the spreading action of yeast to symbolize the pervasive action of sin. Thus, we have a physical symbol, action of leaven, and a spiritual reality, sin that progressively permeates the life of a man or a woman in the same way that leaven progressively permeates dough. For example, adding a drop of ink to a glass of water may create a good parallel to this process. In a manner of minutes, the entire glass takes on the color of the ink. Paul speaks of this same process when he reminds the carnal Christians of Corinth that a little leaven leaveneth or spreads through the whole loaf. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. In the case of the Corinthians, a single man's sin was in the process of spreading throughout the entire church. Sin always grows like a cancer within the church body unless it is stopped through proper church discipline and the sinner's repentance. I would add that spiritual apathy is a subtle sin that progresses throughout a church if the leaders are not spiritually alive and demonstrating the daily work of God in their lives then the people will reflect this and their lives will be very similar it's very interesting that as a leader is so becomes those who are his followers are those under him I've seen that in business offices I've seen that in the military I've seen that 
in the church. Now God used the Feast of Unleavened Bread to remind the Hebrews that just as they left the physical leaven of Egypt behind, so too should they leave its sinful corruption behind. Consequently, God counters this leavening effect with three commands for this feast, for he clearly desires his people to avoid sin in their lives. These three commands to the Hebrews are found in Exodus chapter 13, and we'll begin with verse 1, where the Lord says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt and out of the house of bondage. For by the strength of the hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall be no leavened bread be eaten. Three commands. One, sanctify or set apart your firstborn. Number two, remember this day, the day they were leaving Egypt. And three, no leavened bread is to be eaten. When God delivered them, he did it with the blood of the lamb. Thus, for all purposes, the firstborn that was saved that night belonged to God. Therefore, he wanted them to be sanctified. Now, I've already suggested the real sense or meaning of the word sanctify is to set apart to something. God wanted them to be sanctified unto him and separated from sin. Hence the first command. They were not to be like the common or profane in the ways of the world. You see, God's people are different because they are to reflect that he is different. God's people are to be free of the world's pollution. Now the second command was to remember this day. The idea here is that their personal separation that began on the Feast of Unleavened Bread has an ongoing application. They were to continue in that separation, for separation is truly ongoing. This is why the feast was to be observed for seven days, not just one. With the feasts, the number of days they are observed reflects significant spiritual truths. The third command, to eat no leavened bread. This pictures the need to allow no sin to enter into the assembly from the world and its pollution of sin. If we look for one idea which unites these three commands for Israel, it is the idea that the new nation of Israel was to be separated unto God and separated from the nations of the world. Separation is always from something to something. Remember, Israel's feasts recall mountaintop historical experiences for the nation. On this particular feast, Israel was separated from Egypt and began a journey to the promised land, pictured by the first day of the feast. Once the sea closed on the Egyptians, there wasn't any turning back. Israel had begun a journey to the promised land. God had supernaturally separated them. He did all the work to put them in this position that was separated from the Egyptians pursuing them. They did nothing on their own except walk across the sea on the dry land. The five days of this feast then symbolize the journey of Israel for 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Israel completed that journey of 40 years in a similar manner as they finally passed through the Jordan on dry ground, the 10th day of the first month. That day we will learn later was called the day of Passover preparation. They camped at Gilgal, that was recorded in Joshua chapter 4, verse 19. Then on the 14th day, they observed the memorial of Passover. Observing the first great appointment reminded them 
of the way God had met with his people and started them on this journey to the promised land 40 years earlier. The entry and the completion of the journey was symbolized by the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You see, God bracketed the entire wilderness period with two Passovers. Surely, the people who knew their history recalled their journey and realized that those who had disobediently looked back to Egypt, hindering their admittance to the Promised Land for 40 years, those were now dead. The nation now stood purified before God, as he affirmed in when he declared in Joshua 5, verse 9, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Wherefore the name of this place is called Gilgal unto this day. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the month at even, in the plains of Jericho. The following day, Israel ate manna for the last time, verse 11 of Joshua 5. At this point, the Lord officially declared Israel's complete separation from Egypt and ended the daily supply of the wilderness bread manna. Their life in the promised land would be symbolized by the very next appointment, the very next feast, the Feast of First Fruits, in which God officially declared them to be a nation living in the land of Canaan. Thus, this mountaintop appointment of unleavened bread commemorates Israel's separation from Egypt after a long journey, as well as the nation's entrance into the promised land. Now, as we view this event, we need to next understand the doctrinal teaching of this feast. What can we as Christians learn from the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember, the feasts also picture seven spiritual steps, if you will, in our journey from deliverance until glorification. From a spiritual aspect, we learn that no one can escape the world's enslaving grip of sin apart from the supernatural intervention of God. Remember that God allowed only his people to pass through the sea on the dry land. He destroyed the Egyptians who had no right to enter the land with his people. Only God's people who had been delivered, or our term saved, and set apart for sanctification by God through the shed blood of the Lamb can enter into his rest, the promised land of eternity. Those admitted to heaven must be free of sin and its permeating action. They must be unleavened. When we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we are delivered from this enslaving grip of sin and slavery. This was the Passover for us spiritually. But... Do we stop sinning at the point of salvation? At that point of deliverance? <laughs> the answer is obviously no. Then how do we change? Well, we call this change or this process sanctification. The Bible indicates three distinct phases in the process of sanctification. The first phase is positional sanctification, pictured by that first Sabbath day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We then have a progressive sanctification throughout our life on earth. That's pictured by the five ordinary days of the feast. Then there, the last phase, the final phase, if you will, is final sanctification, or some people call it 
the prophetic sanctification. I think final sanctification is the best term. That's pictured by that last Sabbath day of the feast. Now let's look a little more in depth at these three steps. The first step is positional sanctification. Through his shed blood, the Lord accomplished positional sanctification in the believer. According to 1 Corinthians 6, 11, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, and 1 Peter 1, 2. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, emphasizes the idea of blood-bought sanctification. It says that he, Christ, might sanctify the people with his own blood. Immediately following Passover, deliverance, God separated the Hebrews from the Egyptians. From the Egyptians' perspective now, their former slaves, they were as good as dead, for they were no longer able to serve the Egyptians in any way. Doctrinally, Paul emphasizes this in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, where he makes it clear that the believer in Christ is no longer in bondage to sin. He owes no obedience to his former owners, for Jesus Christ has died for them. Associating positional sanctification with this event of death stresses the one-time instantaneous aspect of sanctification. Just as passing through the Red Sea symbolized entering the grave, so too does the action of positional sanctification. Symbolizes the ending of the believer's old life, according to Romans chapter 7 and verse 4, where we read, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Furthermore, notice the death of the body is an irreversible act. Even in Christ's case, death was not reversed. Rather, resurrection restored him to life, but did not negate the death event or its necessary significance. Therefore, the first aspect of sanctification occurs instantaneously to the believer and is a definitive act performed by God alone. You might want to consider Hebrews 10, verses 10 through 12, and Acts 26, 18. Similarly, the first day of the feast, which was the Sabbath, demands passivity, no work on the part of the observer. One must never forget, however, that even though a person receives instant positional sanctification at salvation, he still may commit sins. First John 1 John 1.9 certainly explains that. Following positional sanctification, the progressive sanctification process begins. The five days between the first and the last Sabbath of the feast symbolize the span of a believer's life with its activities and spiritual growth, and sadly, sometimes periods of sin, sometimes periods of spiritual apathy. One's relationship with God proceeds from the initial, the positional sanctification, and should deepen throughout the believer's life as he or she cooperates by obeying the Word of God and the prompting of the Holy Spirit now indwelling us. The believer progressively becomes more set apart or sanctified. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, he declared, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. But remember, while the deliverance accomplished at Passover freed us, or freed the Israelites, from their old master, the Hebrews didn't immediately experience a major moral change on a personal level. Happily, 
progressive sanctification produces changes that will ultimately lead to a fully reconciled relationship between the believer and God as first existed in the garden before Adam and Eve sinned. The wilderness period, pictured in the five days between Sabbaths, visually demonstrates the sanctification process through the various tests that God presented to the Israelites in order to test or prove out their obedience and faith. During this time for the people, there was no rest, but rather a period of steady growth and development. Israel's entry into the Promised Land symbolized the last aspect of sanctification, perfect or prophetic or, as I like, final sanctification. God will complete the sanctification of church-age believers when their life is ended on this earth and he or she goes to be with the Lord. At that point, God will separate the believer from all sin and bring him into complete fellowship with himself. Here again, God alone, not the believer, accomplishes this final step of the sanctification process. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Since the believer performs no servile work, that means no necessary work, this stage directly corresponds to the second Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Once the believer experiences final sanctification, he or she will be like Christ, truly sinless. For John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The Feast of Unleavened Bread symbolized that mountaintop national event of the wilderness journey of Israel from Egypt to the Promised Land. The spiritual truth taught for you and me, if you know the Lord as your personal Savior, was the concept of the process of sanctification for every believer. The positional being initially set apart at your deliverance or salvation. The ongoing progression of sinning less, knowing the Lord better, growing and maturing in him. And then the final sanctification, our final glorification with a body that is free of sin forever. I look forward to that day. I hope you do too. Now in our next session, we'll continue looking at the rest of the feasts of the Lord. May the Lord truly bless you mightily, and until that session, I'll see you either here or in the air.